The last time a new car and a new brand was born out of sheer frustration was probably Lamborghini, when Ferruccio Lamborghini got sick of Enzo Ferrari's customer service, or lack thereof, and decided to make his own car and his own car company. That's kind of what's happened with this, because billionaire Jim Ratcliffe, yes, the same guy who's just bought a big chunk of Manchester United, um, is the owner of the vast Ineos Corporation, which is primarily a chemical company. But he loved the old original Land Rover Defender. And when that original Defender went out of production, he actually tried to buy the rights to the car and the production line and all the rest of it from Land Rover. Land Rover, not surprisingly, said no because it's their IP. And so instead he decided, well, if I can't have the old Defender, I'll just make one myself. And so here we have it. Ineos is now a car brand and this is the Grenadier, named after the Grenadier pub in which the idea was all dreamed up apparently. It was originally supposed to be built in the UK, it's actually built in a plant in France, um, which used to be uh, the Smart factory before Smart shifted everything over to China. There's a big BMW 3 litre straight six diesel, you can get a petrol version as well. Under the bonnet there's an eight speed automatic gearbox and there is of course fully switchable high range, low range, four wheel drive uh, with optional amounts of differentials. This one has the full set of three locking differentials for ultimate off-road prowess, helped in no small part by these incredibly chunky BF Goodrich tyres. Um, Style-wise, yeah, I mean, I think you can fairly obviously tell that the old Land Rover Defender was an inspiration for this car, but it's not a complete copy of the, of the old Defender. There are bits of, bits of its own design, like this, this, this kind of strangely pyramidal sli uh, slightly uh, shaped bonnet and and there's there's shades of the mercedes-benz g wagon as well which again maybe is not surprising considering that magna steyr the austrian company that builds the g wagon on behalf of mercedes was also contracted by ineos to develop and and help engineer the grenadier there's there's kind of quite a few cool bits on the outside there's there's lots and lots of stuff down the side here for bolting bits and pieces of extras too. There's a rail system here uh, on the roof for hanging things on. There's another rail system here. This is the two-seat uh, two commercial version. This will set you back, inclusive of that, €88,000. This is not a cheap car. This goes head to toe head-to-head -head and toe-to-toe -to -toe with that new Land Rover Defender. But then there aren't many cars that come with a convenient seat on the front for when you're having a picnic or you just want to sit down and admire the view. So maybe we can excuse a little bit of that price. But let's take a look at the interior because there's some really interesting stuff there. Well, I think the interior styling vernacular of the Grenadier is rugged beyond all belief. I mean, this thing, parts of it are quite cheap in places, I have to say, which for a car with this kind of price tag is not particularly good. Like some of the plastics and bits and pieces in the air vents over here look like they're really, really cheap. But when you do get to this center console here, you've got a big screen on top. This is a touch screen, although because it's got some BMW gubbins in it, you can also use the, the click wheel controller down here on the dashboard. Um, this works reasonably well but it does contain your instruments. Um, there's, there, there is a display in front of the driver, but it's purely for warning lights. And I just do think it's a shame that they didn't stretch to doing a proper driver's digital instrument display or, or even some proper you know, analog gauges, which would be entirely in keeping with the design and feel of the Grenadier. Um, I don't like looking over here to get my speed and, and, and vital information like fuel and so on, and you would just end up getting distracted by whatever else is on the screen. So I'm not keen on that. That said, it's quite clear, fairly easy to find your way around. Menu system is quite sensible. It's a bit slow to respond though. It's not as slick as, as some other systems that you can use. Um, the good bit though is down here where you've got what can only be described as military style switches for absolutely everything. Um, it, it, some of the controls feel just like, like this, this temperature settings uh, controller does feel a tiny bit flimsy, but everything else feels really, really tough and rugged. Uh, you've got lever here for high ratio, uh, high, uh, high ratio gears and low ratio gears for proper off-roading. Also your diff lock settings. Uh, you'll recognize this automatic gearbox selector from uh, previous BMW models. The best bit though is up here in the ceiling because if you're going to try and convince someone to part with 88 grand's worth of money, 
I mean, putting really cool switches in the ceiling is a pretty good way to do it. Uh, you, what you've got up here, you've got settings for differential locks. You've got the off-road mode, the wading mode. You've got your hill descent control, your uh, ESC tra uh, traction control and stability control switches. Obviously, you've got light switches, but you've got auxiliary switches here because around the car, there is preset wiring that allows you to fit other bits and pieces, like say you want to put in some external lighting or you want to put in uh, some phone chargers, some extra phone chargers or extra equipment chargers here in the cab or in the back. Well, this is how all that works. You just start flicking all these switches and it turns on the power at those various corners of the car. And frankly, even if you didn't have anything connected, you'd probably just spend half your life just clicking these back and forth because it's really quite satisfying and quite gnarly. I like that. Um, you've got a, not a massive two-spoke uh, two steering wheel. It's actually not as big as I was expecting. Um, it, 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 this one's got the optional leather upgrade pack, so you get some nice uh, slightly patinaed looking leather trim here uh, and here on the wheel and here on the handbrake and some upgraded trim on the doors. Uh, again, there, there is a slight sense of cheapness to some areas. There's good storage. There's a big lockable storage box here. There's a decent sized glove box here, little storage tray here, cup holders here, and big door bins down here. So you are quite well looked after. Now this is the two seat version. So obviously the back is completely blocked off. It's purely a van, this one. Um, there is a four seat N1 version, which is, you know, Effectively, it's still technically a van. You can still tax it uh, as a commercial vehicle, but it does have uh, proper back seats. Um, there is a nice little touch in that there's, there's actually two horns. There's uh, the big loud one and there's the small polite one. I like that. That's quite nice, isn't it? Um, we'll have a quick look in the back, but to be honest with you, the, the, what we really need to do is get out and drive this thing uh, and also take it off road because that is what the Grandier was actually born to do. So one of the areas where Ineos hasn't actually been all that slavish to the old Land Rover Defender design is here in the tailgate, because unlike the Defender, which just had a, a single, relatively narrow central door here, you've actually got two proper doors. And if I can just find the latch, there we are, here on the inside, as you can see, it opens up into an enormous low bay, this being the commercial version. You can absolutely pack this with stuff. Um, it, it, it's certainly, it, it's a bit more useful than the, the big side door uh, that's on the side hinge door, I should say, that's on the current Defender, because if I close that, you can at least get access to the back in, uh, in tight situations. If someone's parked tight up behind you, or if you've pulled in to a relatively short uh, parking space. So, that is nice and practical. Do like that as a touch. Um, again, lots of nice bits of rugged design work going on here. It's all set up for a towing hook down here. It can tow a maximum 3,500 kilos uh, on a braked trailer. Uh, uh, and yeah, it is uh, it is kind of a cool looking thing, isn't it? But let's go and take it for a spin, eh? This Grenadier is such an interesting car, such a curious car in so many ways. It, it, it's just, I mean, I guess, Billionaires tend to get what they want. And what Jim Ratcliffe wanted was to keep the original Land Rover Defender in production. And in a very roundabout way, he kind of has. Because this Grenadier drives and feels almost exactly what you would expect an original Defender to drive and feel like if you gave it a better engine and sorted out the driving position. Because that is honestly what it feels like. Um, and I love that in a lot of ways because I, I, I'm an unabashed fan of the original Defender in spite of all its faults and flaws. And this does fix a lot of the faults and flaws of that car. As I mentioned, the driving position is so much better, so much more comfortable. I can do a long journey like I'm doing this morning uh, with ease. It, it's just not a problem. It, it's actually, okay, it is noisy in here clearly because you've got those big off-road tires um, and you've got all the kind of mechanical whine and grind of the, the, the diffs and the, the, the high and low ratio gears and so on. But it, it is fundamentally a comfortable, usable vehicle in a way that an original Defender just wasn't. That BMW 3 liter straight six diesel engine really helps as well because, okay, it's loud and you can really feel it take a few seconds to kind of gird its mechanical loins to get all those various diffs and gearboxes and everything else turning and burning, uh, particularly from a cold start on a day like today. But once it is, it's it, it might be noisy at times, but it's very, very smooth. Um, 
It is a bit thirsty though. I'm averaging about 12 litres per 100 kilometres on a good day uh, and 13, 14 on a bad day. So it's not an economical vehicle by any stretch of the imagination. Just for comparison, uh, recently uh, driving the, the, the new Land Rover Defender P400E plug-in hybrid, even on long journeys like this, I was getting about eight or nine litres per 100 kilometres fuel economy, much, much better. Um, it's strange. It, it, it's incredibly old school in so many ways and in so many good ways too. Big upright windscreen that defrosts quickly without the need for electric heating elements for us, uh, for instance. Again, on cold days like today, that's a major bonus. There are things like you, you start it by actually putting a physical key in the physical ignition and turning it. Um, uh, and while that is doubtless cheaper to make than a push button start or a keyless start, um, it, it's also more reliable because it's simpler and you can fix it out in the field if it goes wrong. Um, the touchscreen is not bad. Uh, it's full of information. I mean, there's so many details you can call up, even down to tyre temperatures, which uh, actually, seeing as it is, what are we currently, minus one degree outside at the moment, uh, if I just call up the tyre temps, I can tell you that my right front tyre is at 10 degrees, my left front tyre is at 9 degrees, it's all Celsius, obviously, uh, and the two rears are at 11 degrees. I don't know why I need to know that, but it's kind of cool to know. Um, it's also one of the things I love most about this car is its, is, is its switch gear. Um, these big, physical, chunky, clunky switches, these fabulous ones up here on the roof that actually aren't currently connected to anything, but it's sort of ASMR just to drive along idly clicking at them. I, I'm thoroughly entertained by that in a way that I suspect a lot of middle-aged men like me would be. Um, some of the switches down here, I love the way they look, and for the most part, I love the way they work. Some of the rotary switches feel a little bit loose and fragile, not the best. Um, and it's odd that the BMW gear shifter still has the S marking for a sport mode when you knock it to the left, but actually there is no sport mode, that's just manual shift. Um, proper mechanical gear lever too. Again, something that doesn't need another ECU, something that can be fixed out in the field if it breaks. Uh, and I do admire that kind of thinking, even if, again, obviously, it's also cheaper. It's also easier for Ineos to build that on their first car than it is to you know, create a fully electronic system. The steering is properly weird. It has no self-centering. So uh, when you turn a corner, you've got to take the lock off as you come out. Uh, that, can be, that can make the car a bit of an armful uh, when you're coming off of, say, a tight 90-degree junction and you're trying to pull out quickly because there's traffic around. Um, you can manage it and you do get used to it, but it, it is a very strange sensation. Uh, and yeah, it, it, it doesn't make the car the easiest thing to drive. There is no feel or feedback whatsoever. You, corners are more of a negotiation than they are an instruction. That said, it does seem to handle quite tidily for a big heavy machine with big heavy duty suspension and knobbly off-road tires. It hasn't misbehaved once. Braking isn't fantastic, it does stop eventually, but you do need to give that pedal a good old heave and you need to leave a bit more space to the car in front uh, just for safety's sake. Again, very much like the old Land Rover Defender in that respect. It is hugely useful, obviously, more than 2,000 litres of load space in the back uh, of this two-door uh, uh, utility wagon version. This is the commercial version. There is a five-seat N1 commercial version as well, which obviously would be a little bit more useful uh, if you're planning on using it for family duties. I'm not sure that you should do. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, it'll hold 760 kilos of, uh, of weight. Uh, and if you want the ultimate in, in all-round usefulness and practicality, there is the new Quartermaster pickup version as well. Of course, what we really need to do now is drive it off-road because that's what this vehicle is actually designed to do. That's why the steering is weird. That's why it's got the big clunky tires on it. That's why it's got three diff locks and lower ratio gears, all the gubbins underneath that make all the noise, that make it less refined, that make it less of a good on-road tool are designed to make a good off-road. So let's go and do that. And then we can talk about the conclusions. So we took the Grenadier down to the headquarters of Orange Works, which is the Irish company that actually imports the Grenadier here. Now, they're based down at Carton House in County Kildare, and it's not a conventional car dealership. Um, in fact, it's by appointment only. And when you buy one, if you buy one, if you want to think about seriously about buying one, you can go and do fun stuff like this. Now, 
The Grenadier is a proper serious off-roader. I've already mentioned the option of having three fully lockable differentials. That's in the centre and for the front and rear axles. You've got 264 millimetres of ground clearance. You've got high and low ratio gears. Uh, you've got hill descent control. You've got the ability to wade through almost a metre, 800 millimetres of standing water. Uh, and you've got 35 degree approach and 36 degree departure angles. This thing is a serious serious and proper off-roader. Uh, I suppose really the, the only limitation to it is that there's no option of air suspension. So there is the potential for grounding out uh, if you're driving through, say, very, very deep ruts uh, in, in kind of heavy, muddy conditions. But generally speaking, uh, and obviously there's a benefit to that, that you know, without air suspension, you're deleting something that's potentially unreliable, potentially breakable and relying on good old fashioned steel springs and dampers instead. Um, it's off-road here that the, the Grenadier's slightly weird uh, no, uh, no, no self-centering steering comes into its own because it feels pleasantly loose-limbed and easy-going and it means that you, you don't end up bashing your hands off the rim if the steering kicks back over a sharp bump or, uh, or rut. So that is very good. Uh, with these chunky off-road tyres on, to be honest, there aren't many places it won't get into and out of. It is spectacularly capable um, and as always I, I, I aver that, that off-roading is way more fun than say driving on a racetrack or similar it, it is just colossally enjoyable to get off into the countryside in something like this uh, and with 550 newton meters of torque from that BMW straight six diesel you're never going to be short of pulling power up a steep slope or two so yeah the Grenadier is incredibly capable off-road this is really where it belongs it is that hard-working car and it really begs to be used like this please 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 don't use one of these on a school run well I did say that there'd be a conclusion and here it is I have kind of been charmed by the Grenadier I do like a purposeful car I do like a utilitarian car and they don't come much more utilitarian than this it is designed almost for a singular purpose which is getting in and out of inaccessible places to do work and carry heavy stuff and it does that superbly it really really does I think though the problem is while Jim Ratcliffe and Ineos spent all the time looking back at the old Defender and going how do we keep this going they kind of missed the new Defender coming up in the outside lane because really, I mean, in extremis, this probably is a little more capable off-road than the new Defender. But the times when you're actually going to use that capability are probably close to zero in, in its ultimate expression. The current Defender, the new Defender, if you want to call it that, is so absurdly capable when the going gets rough um, that, I, you know, the, the differences between this and that are, are really you're only getting the benefit of this car at the very top end of that off-road performance I think and you know for 99% of people you're just not going to ever use that and the trouble is that when you do want to drive on road the current Defender the new Defender is so refined so smooth so comfortable so sophisticated that I, I can't see any route to picking this over that there's another problem for both of those cars, for this and the Defender, which is that Toyota has a really impressive looking new Land Cruiser coming in a few months time. We haven't driven it yet, so I mean, I can't say for definite that it will be a better car to purchase than either, but it's certainly gonna give both the Grenadier and the Defender a seriously tough time in the market and will probably be more reliable than either overall, let's face it, given the history of such things. Obviously, we can't say with any accuracy how reliable or not the Grenadier is because it's a very new vehicle. There have been some horror stories about build quality. Um, to be honest, I haven't come across anything that gives me any cause for concern during my time with the car, but this is obviously only a week long test. You'd need to drive one for years to really work out the true reliability aspects of it. Obviously, there are always going to be concerns with a new car from a new company in that respect, but then it is being built at a factory that's got plenty of experience with turning out high quality machines. The handback factory that this is made in used to build smarts and obviously Magna Steyr, who engineered it on behalf of Ineos, know how to build a high quality vehicle because Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon. So how to come to a conclusion on this then? It is charming that the switches and the dashboard make it 
achingly cool in some ways, but it is compromised. It, it is so focused on the nth degree of ultimate off-road performance that it does fall behind on the road, and that's where most of us are gonna drive most of the time, and that's where the new Defender really flattens it. Off-road, they're much more equal. Indeed, the Ineos probably has a slight advantage, but it just depends on, on what you use it for. I don't think there's any point in buying this car if what you're going to do is use it for school runs and everyday driving. It just isn't for that. It isn't that kind of car. Uh, you need to be putting this thing to work you need to be actually making full use of it. To be honest, really quite extraordinary capabilities. If you're not, don't buy it. It's not for you. It is a hard working tool of a car. It is, it, it, you know, it's not an SUV in that respect. Um, if you go into that with your eyes open and in knowledge of that and knowing that you will make full use of it, then yeah, yeah, have a go, why not? It's, it's worth a punt, this thing.